How's it going, everybody? Brian Elbers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, March 4, 2024, figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. And we got a lot to talk about here today, including one of the great pay-per-views of all time. But before yeah, well, that... It was, it was a pretty great pay-per-view. God damn, apparently we're lucky to have Dave here tonight. No, you were almost wiped out by what? I wasn't almost wiped out by anything. Oh, don't. You should have heard what the story Dave told me before he we went on the air. I had a power failure. Why Why didn't you watch Collision? Well, I was watching it, and then all of a sudden during the Wardlow promo, the power went out. And? And I looked outside, and it was raining so hard, and the wind was going crazy. You should have seen the trees. They were going crazy. And then right at that moment, my cell phone goes, uh, do not leave your house. Stay inside, hunkered. If you're in a two, if you're in a second story, get in the first story because there's a tornado watch until 6:25 p.m., which is 9:25 p.m. Eastern, which is the middle of uh, collision. A tornado. Torn- that's what it in said. San Jose, California. No, no, Aptos, California. Okay, so you weren't at your house. I was not. At my house. I see. Okay. Well, still. Still, it was it was wow. it was pretty scary. You know, when I was down there, it was kind of like. I'm not driving home so quick. <laughs> wow. But it actually it really cleared up pretty quick, though, after, I, actually. Like, you know, like an hour later, it wasn't bad at all. Well, I'm glad to hear a tornado didn't wipe you out. Cause that no, because been... we, 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 went, we went out to dinner afterwards, you know, wow. like uh, right after, uh, uh, I would say, about 8 o'clock. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, aside from tornadoes, we got a lot to talk about here today, including the retirement of Sting in the main event of the Revolution pay-per-view. A fantastic show, a fantastic it a hell- retirement. It was a hell of a show. It sure it was. Really, was. It really was a hell of a show. Yeah. Sting I mean, and Darby Allen did, in fact, they did it, Dave. They, they beat the Young Bucks in, ironically, a tornado match. That's right. It was the AW tag match. team titles. Yeah. So, so you know, usually like a five hour show is too long, but this one needed twenty more minutes. Well, they did go off the air in the middle of his speech, but if you watched his speech at the end, he didn't miss a whole lot. He called out Tony Khan, and Tony Khan said it was the greatest show ever. And then he called Tony. Uh, Tony Khan was really happy after the show. You don't say. He was really happy after the show, yeah. yeah. And Sting called Shivani into the ring and made him do uh, It Sting. It Sting. And, and then the you know, locker room came out on the ramp, and then they played his music, and he left. I mean, it wasn't like a big... I mean, when I, when I watched the show, what I thought was, I know he's gone and everything like that, but why in the world would they not do a Sting retirement ceremony on Dynamite? I mean, it seems like just such a natural thing to do at some point. I guess we'll I agree. See. I agree. I don't think they're doing it this week because you know they've announced nothing for Wednesday except for um, they have Will the one Ospreay, match. Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher, which may not happen. You know, I mean, um, Tony Khan after the you know in the press conference basically said, like Osprey said that like he 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 was kind of like leaning towards doing it, and Tony Khan was basically saying that we'll call this let's call this one questionable because Osprey took that one suplex deal in the corner and messed up his back, so uh, we'll see. You know, I mean, um, you know, he, he, you know, Osprey kept saying, I'm a Wolverine. I'll be back soon. You know, he, he talked like he'll be, you know, they may do the match Wednesday, but, but, um, Tony Khan did pretty much say, I mean, he just said it's, it's questionable, you know, don't count on that one. Well, I think that we normally start at the beginning, but we should start with the main event here today. And it was Sting and Darby versus the Young Bucks, AEW Tag Team Titles Tornado match. And they brought out Ric Flair. They brought out Ricky the Dragon Steamboat as a special guest timekeeper. They had Magnum is, TA. Is that what he was doing? That's what they said. Okay, I didn't. I knew he was out there. Magnum TA, Scotty Riggs, Lex Nikita Luger Kola. was apparently there, although we never we never, they never saw showed him. him. Nikita no. Koloff was there. Nikita David Crockett. Was, David Crockett was there, and they actually did introduce David Crockett during the pre-show. David Crockett, and uh, then they had a video package where Sting went into a theater. To watch a final Showtime video package. And they had photos like from PWI, videos from AEW, New Japan, and they had a pro, shot pro, of pro, pro, pro Wrestling Noah. Sting doing some spot which was crazy and they cut to a shot of him grimacing at this crazy thing he had. Oh, done. it was one of one of the di- one of the dives in AEW off yes. of like uh, through a table, yeah. And then he says, It's showtime for the last time, let's do this. And so they hit 
is music. And first, out comes full 80s surfer sting. And the place goes nuts till they realize, actually, it's his son. Yeah. And then his uh, other son comes out dressed as Wolfpack Sting. And then they hit his old WCW, uh, WCW music. And out he comes. And the match itself... I mean, this was an excellent match. I mean, they, they did a great job. Yeah, they did a great job. Darby does a wild dive and but I mean, it was everybody. It, it was it was it was on the, you know, I mean, Darby, he, you know, the guy's trying to kill himself. He, uh, well, we'll get to what he did, but they had he, the sons uh, out there doing. But I mean, uh, I mean, he he went through glass and his back was so messed up. Yes, he had the. They had, first, they had the brothers beating up Sting, doing Scorpion Stinger splashes in the corner, and they beat the Bucks all over the place. And so, finally, the first big spot is they're on the ramp, and first Darby takes a Falcon Arrow off the ramp through two tables, and that then from, Sting. That was from uh, Nick. Nick, and then Matt gives him a gives Sting a vertical suplex through two tables. Yeah. And so they bring Darby back down to the ring. Darby makes his big comeback, but then they've got this giant ladder. I mean, this is a... 12 12 foot. Yeah. It was way more than twice as tall as Darby. But regardless, he goes up onto the top of this ladder, and he's going to dive off onto Nick. But Matt pulls Nick out of the way, and Darby flies off this ladder. So even if it was 12 feet, you're still talking the four feet uh, from the ring. Off the ring. Yeah, yeah. You know, he went went 16 feet. He fell 16 feet through chairs and a pane of glass, and his back is just, I mean, you never seen anything like it. I mean, we've seen glass spots. so, so, So it starts, and you see, like, these little spots of blood all over him. But then the blood, so that's where all the cuts, he had like a million cuts that were small, but they just kept bleeding to the point where later his back was just covered in blood. So obviously they get him out of there. The doctors go to take care of him. And then Sting comes back, and for a long time it is a one-on-two match. And Sting fights, and they hit moves, and he fights, and then uh, Matt tries to get the belt, but Steamboat stops him, and so Matt waffles him. And then Flair gets in the ring to cover Sting's body and tell the Young Bucks to stop. And they give Flair a double super kick. Then they give Steamboat a double super kick off the off the ring apron. And at that point, you know, I had I thought Sting should win, but I thought there was a decent chance he would put over the Young Bucks his last match. But man, when he starts beating up Flair and he's beating up Stingboat or Steamboat, I said, man, there's no way this guy is losing after that. No. And in fact. He did not. They go to hit the EVP trigger. He kicks out at one. Demands another one. They hit the double super kick. They go for no longer the Meltzer driver, Dave. You've been replaced. It's a TK driver. Darby runs down, shoves Nick off the top through a table. Sting hits a death drop. Matt kicks out. And then Darby hits Matt with a coffin drop. Sting puts him in the scorpion. Matt taps out. Place goes absolutely nuts. And aside from Darby's back getting all gashed all to hell, I wouldn't have changed a thing. This match was perfect. A perfect send-off. It was a great Sting. match. Oh, yeah. It was a great match. Um, yeah, I mean, very few people have matches, have final matches like that. That's for sure. I don't know if anyone has I'm a match to... that, of that caliber. Shawn Michaels? Shawn Michaels had a, but then uh, he came. But then he came back. He did come back, and his last. Then he match came back, and his good. match, his last match wasn't good at all. It wasn't even a good match. No, but his second to last match was was really good. Although this match was just as good as that. I mean, it's completely different. I mean, that was a better wrestling match. This was more of a stunt show, but it was still, um, you know, I think. I mean, that's they're comparable. I would say. I mean, Ric Flair's last match, the attempt was to be this good, but it wasn't. Um. Terry Funk. Well, he had like forty of them. Uh, his might his his one of one of the forty might have been two of them. I, actually, might have been better. The I Quit match and the um, the first Japan match. I would say the first Japan match was a better match, but the atmosphere was was definitely better. Yeah. Well, the first speech that we got from Sting before they went off the air was the better one, where he thanked Greensboro, said he'd be the thank of the fans since March of '88. That forty five minute draw for the title with Rick. Thank you, Rick. He says, I don't know if he's still here, but thank you. And he said, Greenboro, you're incredible in 88. You're incredible tonight. And he said, I just wanted to give fans a night of wrestling that will be etched in your mind for years to come. 
Tonight I'll never forget. Thank you, Greensboro. You're awesome. He said Darby was the best tag team partner he'd ever had. They didn't boo this. They didn't boo when he said it this time. I wonder how many stitches he was going to require. And Darby says, "You know, I said I'd die in your last match, but I'm still, I'm still breathing." And didn't s- die. Sting. I guess he's going out, going to climb Mount Everest next. End of the month, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Sting said Darby was a risk taker, like I was when I was young, and I'm kind of old now, but I'm still a risk taker. And the fans chanted, "You still got it." And they went off the air at that point. And uh, just fantastic. It was just fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was a great. must-see match. It was a must-see pay-per-view. It was a great crowd, too. I mean, like like in the in the pre-show, the crowd wasn't anything special at all. And I was going like, ah, oh, you know, not that great of a crowd. But once that main show started, um, they were pretty hot for, you know, most matches. Most and, of it. Most of it. No. I mean, the, women, the, 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 women's, the women's match, no. But, I mean, look. Didn't, who did the women's Who did the women's match follow? Did they follow the? Um, let me see. It wasn't an issue of who they followed, dude. It was an issue of nobody wants to boo Tony Storm and nobody wants to get behind Deanna Parazzo. It was the same thing in every segment yeah, they yeah. did. The yeah, they interview did segments had no heat. The angles had no heat. Tony is miscast. She needs to be a babyface. Yeah, it's all there it was is after to the it. FTR match, which was a hell of a match. Yeah, but every it could have been after any match, Dave. I mean, there was no match it could have followed. I mean. Could have been on Saturday Osprey. The the Osprey match was ridiculous. Well, take it's us through show. this pre-show here, then we'll do the main show. Yeah, well, I mean, just the um, the Kingston match, the uh, the Roddy match was very good, but the Kingston match, the FTR match, and the Osprey match, and the the main event, and the um, I mean, even the World Title three way was was really freaking good. This was, a, was really a hell of a show. So the the prelim stuff. Um, Bang Bang Scissors Gang against Private Party, um, Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh, and Willie Mack was fine. There was nothing right or wrong with it. It was just 12 guys. Um, Satnam Singh really didn't look particularly good. Um, but, I mean, everything. Else, everybody else was fine. Um, Jay White used the Blade Runner on Willie Mack to pin him which is setting up uh, Jay White against Darby, which will be on the Boston show on the 13th. And I'm going to guess that uh, since Darby's leaving, they may be uh, building something up for Jay. Jay did a promo afterwards, and it was like, you ever, you know, one of the things sometimes that happens there in AEW is guys don't always know what they're doing and where they're going. You don't say? Yeah, and boy, was this an example. Jay White was out there doing a promo, and he literally had no nothing to say. It was just kind of like, um, you know, I love Greensboro. I thought he was like, you know, I love Greensboro. It's one of my favorites. Jay White was doing a baby face. I love Greensboro. Yeah, wow. because he had nothing to say. He like he had no direction. He had not, nowhere he was going. Just because I love Greensboro. It's one of my favorite cities in the entire world. Um, I don't even know if he, how many times did he wrestled in Greensboro. Um, he mentioned that he's wrestled Will Ospreay before. Um, he, you know, uh, what else did he say? He didn't really say much of anything. Oh, he said that, that we are, um, two of the best trios teams in the, in the world and the best 12 man team, the best six man team, whatever it's called, six way team in the entire business. And then he said, we're the best stable. And, um, you know, and uh, something big is going to happen on Wednesday. So and then they all said guns up. So that's what happened. Then um, Orange Cassidy. Um, this actually didn't play into the match at all because the Roderick Strong Orange Cassidy match was did not have interference until the match was over. But Orange Cassidy told Trent Beretta and uh, Rocky Romero and Chuck Taylor. And he just goes... Um, um, he asked them to stay in the back because I'm tired of my friends trying to help me and always getting hurt. So um, this is like every time a baby face goes against like this stable of guys that always interferes and then tells his partners to stay in the back. I don't want your help. I just think like, don't you have like a m- more creative way of doing it? Like, I don't know what, you know, like locking them in a dressing room or something to keep them away because it's like, it's just, it makes the baby face look completely stupid. Um, Pac is on his way back. Uh, then they had Tony Schiavone and David Crockett 
uh, talking about um, how they used to spend Thanksgiving in that building and all those great nights in that building and all that. And then uh, Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander against Julia Hart in Sky Blue, which was also okay. Um, never really got going, I don't think. Willow did a couple of cool things here and there, but just kind of just a match. And then um, Willow, um, what was it? Uh, Willow pinned uh, Sky Blue with the Doctor Bomb after a pounce, and they didn't really like indicate like where it was going. Like if Willow's going to be challenging Julia Hart, like uh, you know, you would think that that's probably where they're going, but they didn't really overtly tell you. And then uh, that was the pregame show. We had those two matches, and neither of them were anything special. Neither of them had any kind of special heat either. Well, you can also have to take us through this uh, Daniel Garcia Christian match because uh, I could not get this BR Live app to work for the life of me. Yeah, a lot of people had problems with it, Brutal. which is which is interesting because you know they were expecting one of the biggest pay per view numbers that they have, and. Of all of the places they do pay-per-view, they have television, they have BR, and then they have Triller, which is Triller's outside of the United States. BR is the one, by far, that gets the most buys. Like, I would estimate on a show like this, you know, BR would be, you know, eighty, ninety thousand 90,000 buys. So if they got messed up by... And they ended up allowing Triller to sell in the United States because there were so many problems with BR. But when you're doing something like that, the show was already on when Tony Khan made that call, you know, to allow Triller to, to sell in the United States. So it probably, um, you know, there was no pay-per-view estimates out, and I thought that there would be. Um, well, I'll the other some- thing, too, is like, yeah, that's 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 great that that was allowed and everything like that. But, I mean, if you're on the fence about the show, you're like, okay, you know what, I'm going to get it. And then you, because I ordered it. It was already ordered. It was like I couldn't order it. It was ordered, but I couldn't watch it. So if I can't watch it, it's like, okay, do I want to spend another $50 to buy it on Fight and hope that I can get a refund from BR? Like, the issue, the issue wasn't ordering. It was like, I can watch it. So, I mean, I guess uh, maybe some people bought it twice, but I don't know how many people were willing to do that. Yeah. Okay, so Christian and Daniel Garcia, um, they had a very good match. Um, let me see. Christian... Uh, was <clears throat> did a lot of very he, he slowed it down early, a lot of stalling, faking a knee injury spot. Uh, did a plancha over the post, which I was surprised, being that he's a heel and everything like that. Um, Garcia worked over his left ankle for an ankle lock. Um, he Garcia uh, backdropped Nick Wayne over the barricade when Nick Wayne tried to attack him, and um, what else? Um, he went for a with Christian went for a spear once and his knee went out, which was actually a pretty cool spot. Um, Garcia threw him over the ring steps. Christian just splashed off the top, and Garcia moved and got the ankle lock. Uh, also, the back suplex. Christian monkey flipped Garcia into the turnbuckles. Kill switch choke slammed uh, Garcia when the ref was distracted. Um, and uh, Christian did a splash off the top for a near fall. Matt Menard threw Killswitch into the post. And Matt Menard uh, and Killswitch brawled to the back. And then uh, that's when Christian's tried to spear. His leg had been worked over. And as he, like, as he was doing the spear, he just falls on his face because his knee gave out. Garcia gave him a pile driver for a near fall. Jackknife cradle. Christian held the, grabbed the ropes to avoid the three count. And then, um, uh, what was it? Um, there was distraction. Um, Shane Wayne distracted the, uh, the ref. Uh, Nick Wayne snapped his neck on the top ropes. And kill switch, um, well, Christian did the kill switch, got the pin, retained the championship. Uh, no Adam Copeland. Nobody else ran in or anything like that. All right, the uh, first match I saw, Brian Danielson, Eddie Kingston, Continental Crown. Awesome match. Excellent match. Just a fantastic match with these two guys. And Brian took like 90% of the match, which if I had one thing I would change about the match is I would give Eddie more because Eddie had already submitted on Dynamite, 
And so I think most people going in figured that he was going to win this match. And then after Brian just kept beating on him for like 15 straight minutes, it was pretty clear who was winning in the end. Yeah. But uh, Eddie finally got some comebacks there at the end, and they slapped the hell out of each other. K- Kingston got a lot of suplexes in, Kobashi chops, things like that. He chopped the hell out of them early on. Um, side of suplex, did a tope, started selling his knee, and that's when Danielson started taking over from that point. Um, Danielson gave him a suplex off the apron, and uh, Danielson started working on his fingers with the idea, I guess, that... Well, Kingston chopped the post. That was one of the things that happened. And then... Um, well, they finally went to the no-selling and... the big suplexes at the end. Back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, double down. Everyone's going, this is awesome. The place and went... They, they, did, they did a giant standing ovation at one point when they were both down. Slapped the hell out of each other. Brian went for the knee, but Eddie hit him with a lariat, turned him inside out, powerbombed him, and pinned him. Yeah. And so the big angle afterwards is Eddie goes towards him, and he's thinking of offering the handshake, but then he's like, ah, fuck it. And he starts to leave, but Brian says, no, no. And Brian offers a hand, but Eddie, as he's going in, Brian turns around, and Eddie goes to leave again, and Brian says, hold on a second. And he offers his hand again, and this time Eddie shakes, but then he realizes it's a bad hand. He goes, other hand. And they shook hands, and then Brian raised his hand, and uh, they paraded around, hugged, and then he did like a three-minute promo in the locker room afterwards. And, uh, yeah, the post-match was great. The match itself was awesome. On most AEW pay-per-views, this would have been the best match on the show. On this pay-per-view, it was not. It was the, I think it was the third best, maybe? It was the second best match. The second best match? I actually thought the second best match was the FTR match. But a lot of people thought the second best match was the Young Bucks match. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We had uh, Hook and Magnus, Lance Archer, Brian Cage, Wardlow, Dante Martin, Chris Jericho, and Hobbs in a superstar scramble match. And a very weird hodgepodge of different dudes, all different sizes, different styles. Like Magnus in there and Jericho and Hook and somehow they made it work. I well, thought this was a good match. And they, I I thought that there was a lot of good moves. I thought I thought they actually laid out a great match, but execution wise it wasn't a great match. I think there was a lot of um you know Dante Martin I think did like two dives and his he did he get his caught, foot caught on both of them? Uh, he may have. Is actually his far by far his worst performance was Collision, where he almost killed himself multiple times. Yeah, You're just going too fast. But the thing about this match is, this was originally going to be Meat Madness, and then it got changed. I guess because Miro and and Keith Lee were unavailable. Well, but that's I weird. don't know how you wouldn't know Keith I don't, Lee. I don't know. Well, Keith Lee had double knee surgery, and Miro said that he's been out of action since J- December or January. Well, it has to be January because he wrestled December 30th. But he's been out of action since January, and there was no... And neither had been advertised. No. Everybody you would have done in Meat Madness was in this match. I mean, you could have done what was was the four-way, like the three guys they announced on Brian Cage and just done that. Well, yeah, they, to... they, they actually did a spot early where it was Hobbs, Brian Cage, Lance Archer, and Wardlow. And they essentially did a short meat madness match, and it was the most well, heat this match a, they, had. They did a they did a couple of spots. Well, they did several spots. They did the clotheslines where nobody would go down. They yeah. did the shoulder blocks where nobody would go down. But the you people that, were into it. Meat chance, meat madness, meat forever. Oh, and yeah. then uh, the little guys got in, and they they got booed because they were not meaty. And uh, yeah, a lot of no, big they spots. were chanting. They were chanting mini meat at him. Mini meat. I think it was mini meat. Yeah, yeah, mini meat. When they were doing, they would do all their spots, and people would go mini meat, mini meat, like Mm. that. Everyone traded some near falls at the end. Wardlow, who actually looked really good in this match, took out everybody. Powerbomb Dante pinned him, so he will be getting an upcoming AW title shot. Yeah, him and Samoa Joe. I don't know if that's going to be the next pay per view. So they added a pay per view April twenty first from the Chaffetz Arena in St. Louis, AW Dynasty, and. you know, I mean, Tony on uh, to the press thing on Thursday and said that they would probably do nine or ten pay-per-views this year. You know, they did eight last year and just talked about how, you know, I mean, they were more successful than any year. And just, um, yeah, they're not going to have as many long gaps between pay-per-views. So um, that's what it's going to be. 
Um, you know, everybody else does, you know, 12, so 10 is not, I don't think 10 excessive at all. Um, I wouldn't do 12, though. I think 10 is about where you would go. I think that's, th that's the right one. It might, e <clears throat> it might end up only being 9. But, um, yeah, that's what he's looking at. We had Orange Cassidy, Roderick Strong, AW International title, and this was a very, very good match. Just Ro Roderick Strong was great. He destroyed this guy. He is the, the messiah of the backbreaker. Orange Cassidy came in with an alleged bad back and ribs taped up, and, man, Roderick Strong just took this guy apart. And Orange eventually managed to escape the stronghold Tilt a whirl, went up top at the diving DDT, hit the Panama Sunrise, and finally went for the punch. Roddy avoided it, but then he got punched out of nowhere. Orange tried the beach break, but he collapsed, hit it. Roddy got the feet on the ropes, and then finally Orange tried the punch. Roddy avoided it again, hit the end of heartache, won the title. Clean in the middle, no interference. Yeah, no, no interference from Taven and Bennett. Yep, yep, pinned him, and then he and Taven and Bennett are celebrating. And somebody enters the ring, and the fans suddenly realize, oh, my God, it's Kyle O'Reilly. And he's looking like he's going to attack Roddy, but then he smiles and hugs him. The place goes nuts for his return, and Bennett takes off his shirt. He gives it to Kyle. Kyle's got tears in his eyes, but he takes the shirt, and he drapes it over Roddy's shoulder, whispers something in his ear, walks out of the ring. So, Didn't take the shirt. Did not take the shirt. He's been cleared for a while. So apparently he can come back, and uh, we'll see where they go here. Yeah, so he's back. Um, the Kenny Omega question came up after the show, and uh, Tony Khan, they basically said that um, he's advertised for Winnipeg, um, and Tony basically said that he does not expect him to be wrestling by Winnipeg, but he gave the impression that he would be appearing um before that so he may be making an appearance i know he's advertised for an appearance in toronto which is in <coughs> it's in two weeks from wednesday so i don't know if he will be there for an appearance but i got the impression he would be in winnipeg but probably not uh wrestling in winnipeg so then we had bcc and ftr which was another this excellent an awesome match. match this is an awesome match and uh the story here is that uh you know, the crowd was into both teams. I mean, they were chanting BCC. They were chanting FTR. BCC was in the heel role. FTR was in the babyface role. But there were a lot of people that were into BCC. And just had a, a great match. Heat on cash, heat on Dax, hot tags for both. This is awesome chance. And uh, finally, I mean, we had one scary spot, which was um, involved Dax. Oh, it was uh, they went for a doomsday device on Dax. And I don't know if maybe Dax, I don't know what happened, but he decided he was going to flip over. And he got exactly halfway over, and he fell down right on his shoulder and his yeah. head. And it, was more, I, more sho it was more shoulder. I thought, my God, separated shoulder or worse, who even knows. But, man, he got back up, and he just kept working. He was using the arm. Yeah. Yep. They had the Doomsday device on Moxley, but he jumped to his feet, no sold it, but then they hit a shatter machine, so he was down. Claudio broke up the pin. And so they're going back and forth. And finally, Dax tries a cradle, and uh, Moxley puts him in the choke. And so Cash is on the outside. He tries to climb in to make the save, but Claudio well, grabs well, him. Well, but Moxley used the Death Rider on Dax and then did that, that pin where you, where you turned it into the crucifix, which, in fact, is exactly what happened. Dax crucifixed him, and then uh, Moxley kicked out. And then... Um, Put yeah. him in the choke, and then uh, Cash tries to get in the ring, but Claudio Claudia. grabs him and puts him in a choke. Yeah. So BCC has both of them in a choke, and Dax taps out. A double submission was yeah. essentially the finish. Yeah. And uh, this means to me either uh, BCC is the next tag team champions or they are doing a tournament, doing and a tournament. I would not be the least bit surprised if FTR beats BCC in the finals. Could be they're doing, but they are doing a tournament, and I think it's going to be it's going to be on TVs probably starting this week or next, and it's going to be something to the effect of obviously they can't call it March Madness, but it's going to be something to the effect of March Madness. So they're going to be doing their tournament at the same time college basketball is doing the tournament, 
And, um, you know, I'm sure that on Wednesday they'll be announcing the details of the tournament. Well, then we had Tony Storm and Deanna Parazzo for the AW Women's title. And Mariah May came out in Tony's old gimmick. and uh, Old ring outfit. Old ring outfit. And then they had a match, and there was no heat. And everybody wants to cheer Tony. They're not behind Deanna. Tony's working heel. She gave Deanna a low blow for the heat. The announcers were like, how does that work? And they said, well, it works. It works. So there you go. So uh, Deanna fires up, makes a comeback, got booed because she's beating up Tony, and then uh, puts on the ankle lock. Tony bumped outside. Luther caught her. Deanna did a dive off the post. And then finally, Deanna bumps Mariah off the apron, turns around, gets hit with a pile driver pin. Yeah. That's it. Well, Deanna had the Venus de Milo on when Luther distracted the referee, and then Tony, uh, Mariah May jumped on the apron. And then. uh, Deanna Prazo let go of the move to kick Mariah May off the apron, and then uh, Tony Storm hit her with a pile driver and got the pin. Match was fine. I mean, actually, from a wrestling standpoint, the match was good, but didn't have a lot of heat. Yeah. Well, then, if you want to talk about some heat, Will Ospreay and Takeshita with Don Callis on commentary. This is this is a match of the year contender. This Will Ospreay needs to He's be great... top babyface Wednesday. Oh, I yeah. mean, he is so over. They went nuts for this guy. He's they gonna were, they were going to deliver every they, time he's in the ring. They were going nuts for him before the show even started. Yes. He's he's the guy. When they when they put the graphic on the screen, there's only two matches when they put the graphic on the screen where you could hear the giant pop, and it was this one and of course the main of the Sting match. But yeah, as soon as like that graphic came up and I heard the people go crazy, it's just like well, guess we don't got to worry about that fallacy about how nobody knows this guy because they popped big. And when he came out, like for a guy who has had very little television and none in months um, other than Wednesday, um, he, they, you know, they just, he's a superstar. They know enough people know he's a superstar. Well, and, uh, man, if they didn't know, they know now because God but, damn this match they had. Takesha was incredible. Will Osprey was incredible. Yeah. First ever match between these two, and they, like, they'd worked in they'd worked in a tag match once. Apparently. My God, this was awesome. We had so many incredible spots. The highlight, I think, was when Will Osprey goes for the os cutter, and Takeshita caught him in mid move and turned it into a blue thunder bomb. Oh yeah, that's that. This that was, place went nuts for that spot. That was incredible. It was, that was so a great awesome. They went nuts for the Styles Clash spot, like really nuts. Um, when they knew all of Osprey's moves, it was really, you know, the match really was the two guys just doing their, their, their usual moves. And I mean, cause, cause again, I've seen so much of Osprey and I could see the moves coming, but even when you do, they do it with such speed and devastation that it's just not, it's like they're, they're just at a different level of, of, you know, from almost anyone else in the business. So well, like, the thing I've noticed with like Osprey, Omega, it's like Omega and Okada were years ago. I think I noticed with Osprey, and I, I really noticed it. Uh, well, I think in every last single match he's ever had, but the Michael Oku match was when I, I really started thinking about it. He, like, he's changed his style up. Like he still does, he still does some crazy shit, but he doesn't like. It's not out of control. It's like he's 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 a smarter worker. He does a little bit less, but the thing is, everything he does, when you look at it. It's like, with... have I ever seen anyone do that better? Like, it really hit me when he hit... Uh, his, 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 his technique is, is is absolutely incredible. He hit Oku with a back suplex. Lift him up, put him on their back. Everybody does it. This back suplex was like the most incredible back suplex I ever saw. And then he has a Pescado. Everybody does a Pescado. I watched his Pescado. It was like, that's the best Pescado I've ever seen. It's like you watch the match, and it's like, does anybody do that match better than him? At best, you'll find someone who does it as good. But, like, is there any move he does where there's, like, somebody else that does it better? It's just like every move he does is like that. It's not the different variety of moves or or how many moves. It's like he has a set of moves that he does, but every single one of them, it's like you've never seen anybody do it better. It's because of his. It's because of his speed 
and a little bit of power and conditioning, but it's the speed that's the key. He does it a little bit faster, and he drops them a little bit harder. You know, it's just that that's that's what it is. It's it's very similar to Terry Funk. Now, Terry Funk didn't do a lot of super sensational moves, but Terry Funk would take every bump in a manner that nobody else does. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Ray Stevens did to a degree, but really, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a, got a cough, but Terry Funk, like everything he does was just the same moves that everybody else did, but he just did him. He, the bump would be just a little bit more devastating and he would just flip a little more or do a little thing. And I noticed like in the last year when I watch Osprey, you know, before the thing with Osprey was he just did all these crazy moves and, um, you know, but now it's just what he does. He does everything better than anyone else. And I mean, it's really come to the point now where it's almost like I think that we almost have to add a move, um, an award next year for best match of the year that doesn't include Will Ospreay because it's just like nobody's got a chance unless they're in the ring with this guy because he's, he's just so incredible now. I mean, like this year, of the four best matches I've seen this year, this is one of the four. And the other ones would be Will Ospreay against Michael Oku, Will Ospreay against Josh Alexander, and then the other one's Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. So it's like we're we're only in March, the first week of March, and he's already had three of the four best matches of the year. And this match was very similar to the Josh Alexander match, but I think it's just, I think this was a slightly better version of that same match where it's just um you know, where you have somebody who's almost as equal in the ring. And that's one of the reasons why the match is so good, whereas the Oku match was just pure storyline. So it's a completely different style of match than you would pro than you'll probably ever see, you know, for the Will Ospreay in the United States, just because there's nobody that he's got a three year storyline with. But um Takeshi, I think it was Takeshi's best match in the United States. Um, he just, you know, he's another one. He's so quick and so athletic. <clears throat> Excuse me. He he did a German suplex. I mean, he did a lot of German suplexes. He did a wheelbarrow. He did, you know, I mean, he's the master of it anyway. But he did one German suplex that was just as picture perfect a German suplex as you'll ever see. So uh, there was also the spot where uh, he gave him the top rope brain buster, but he actually missed the turnbuckle, and he fell and right down on his head and smashed his back on the buckle and was all yeah, messed it, up. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the that's the injury that may keep him out on Wednesday. Is his back had this giant um, rash looking thing, you know, and he had a big bump on his back. I mean, he definitely that move hurt him, and he's you know he sold it, but he came back. And, I mean, the rest of the match, you know, he was still the same. And in his post-match interview, he didn't come. He wasn't limping in there. He wasn't bending over or hunched over. And he was happy as hell. I mean, it's like he just sat there and he was just so happy. And he did, he gave a great, um, you know, he, he talked about what a challenge this is going to be because, you know, he's he, you know, he goes like, you know, once a match starts, I'm pretty confident what I can do. But. You know, he's never done American style personality interviews. Like his interviews are like he does a great interview like a Bret Hart would do, where you're just telling the truth as you see it and you do a good delivery of it because you believe it. He's really good at that. But, you know, um, one of the things in those interviews is he's always swearing. He can't do that on American TV. And he said he's got to learn how to not swear. And he says it's very difficult for him to talk without swearing in fact he was trying to do it in his post-match interview and i think he swore four times so he may have some trouble there on some of these interviews but he said he's got to you know that's the thing he's got to learn this year is how to do american style television interviews and get over doing them as opposed to just getting over by going out there and having great matches because if you go over there and have great matches it's it's like it's um you know it's especially now, even as great as his matches are, that's not gonna that alone is not gonna get you to the superstardom that, that he needs to be. You know, I mean he needs to be you know, he needs to be the guy who's gonna win the world championship at uh Wembley this year. I mean, to me that's like the most obvious storyline for the whole year. It's the thing that they should do. I don't care who the champion is, I don't care if it's Swerve, I don't care if it's Joe, I don't care if it's Adam Page, I don't care if it's Brian Danielson, whatever, whoever ends up with that belt. They need to lose it to Will Ospreay at Wembley Stadium, and that's the other going to be the other big moment of the year, along with this Sting thing tonight. 
So, uh, end of the match. I mean, Cal's doing commentary the entire time, putting over how athletic both guys are. And then uh, finally, we had a striking battle, Styles Clash, Tiger Driver 91, which Kels was not happy. One of his buddies dropped the other one in the head. And then uh, hit the hidden blade and got the pin. Just an absolutely fantastic match, absolutely fantastic debut as an AEW contracted performer. And then Kyle Fletcher came down to the ring afterwards, and uh, they talked about what great friends they were. They'd live together, train together, and they're wrestling each other on Wednesday if they can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He talked, put over um, Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis is like two of his best friends, and can't wait for Mike, Mark Davis to get back as well. And then uh, we had the Hangman Swerve and Samoa Joe match, AW World Title, and the key to this match is uh, everyone had a chance to shine. They did a lot with uh, Hangman, and actually, at the beginning Joe just ran wild and destroyed everybody, and then they got Swerve and Hangman in there to work on their feud. And uh, finally, at the end, Nana hands Swerve the crown to use as a weapon, but Nana throws it back. No, Swerve throws it back. Swerve threw it back. So it looks like they're finally going to pull the trigger on the full-on Swerve babyface turn. So he cradles Joe. Hangman attacks Bryce, the referee, beats him half to death, which got a ton of heat. And the announcers are talking about how that's got to be a fine, that's got to be suspension. And I think Hangman is gone for a while. Oh, so, so it's going to be suspension. So I think that's going to be the storyline reason for that. Mm-hmm. So uh, Joe went for the muscle buster. Swerve shoved him into a buckshot. They go back and forth, and then dro- uh, Joe drops Swerve on his head, puts a choke on Hangman, and Swerve is going to try and get back into the ring, but Hangman taps. And so the story is, was he really trapped, or did he not want Swerve to win the title? So uh, it's an excellent match. I thought all three guys were great. Yeah, yeah, and they were great. Joe retains the title to go on to face Wardlow. And that was it. The main event was the main event that we talked about. And, I mean, if you're looking for a show that has absolutely fantastic matches, I mean, a main event that you'll never forget if you watched it. I mean, that was his and, goal. And, 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 and what's probably going to be one of the top five matches of the year. Easily, I would say, one of the top five matches of the year. Yeah. I mean, this is a. I mean, it would have been that 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 would have been a match of the year in probably, you know, what, thirty five of the last forty two years, something along along those lines, some some something like that. And you know, Tony Khan said this was his. Uh, he, I think he said that he thought this was the best pay per view that ever run. He did say that. He he said it was his his uh, favorite night. This I, and Wim- I think this, this might have been my this. my favorite night, and I think it might have been the best pay per view I I remember AEW running. Really, I think so. It was awesome. I thought some of those early ones were, you know, when I thought back, I thought some of those early ones were better. I will say last year's Revolution, which won Show of the Year, this was a better show than last year's Show of the Year. You know, you asked me the other day about buys, and I uh, I, I I had a low number. I'm not good yeah. at this until the day of the show. When the day of the show comes, I have a much better feeling, the buzz and everything. I think this show's doing pretty damn big number. I think it's doing bigger than I than I predicted. I mean, I think one ninety is a pretty safe bet. One ninety is high. I will say this: like, I always am low. I think there was one show where I wasn't, which was um last year's Forbidden Door, which I think that I was actually I think I was a little even high on last year's Forbidden Door. But almost every AEW show when I do a prediction, I'm usually low, but not low by much. Usually by ten to fifteen thousand. But this one, I said 160. So if I'm low, you know, I could see 170, 180. If the the, the bleach report thing can't help, though, you know, that can't that probably can't help them. Because um, if people like, uh, I mean, I guess if there's no trouble at ordering, but then you don't get yeah, it. Yeah, that's the issue. People, it wasn't it wasn't ordering. It was you couldn't watch it. Yeah, but people so, are gonna want refunds. Well, yeah, but you know what? I heard a lot of people that you know about 30 minutes in, they were finally able to get on, and they could probably watch the replay later. So I don't know how refunds are going to affect it. I mean, people eventually did get on. But I mean, the first half hour it was like it was impossible. It's bad. It's bad. You know what? I I mean, it's like because it's the same thing. It's like ESPN and UFC. It is freaking ridiculous, and it's still like even on the very last show, it was the same thing. It's like I don't know what it is. I've tried. I've done in multiple computers. People always tell me that they have problems. I have no trouble on on my television, but on all my computers, I have trouble. And when I'm on the road, which I am on a lot of Saturdays, which is when UFCs have shows, 
it is freaking brutal. It takes like time after time. I mean, it's easy to buy, but to log in, it's just like... I remember that same thing. It was like, I buy it, and then you try and watch it, and it says, you're not authorized to view this, and then you try it yeah. again, and you try it again. And like, I, I, there was no solution. It was like, I would keep trying, keep trying, keep yeah, trying, keep like, trying, keep like, trying, and then suddenly it just worked. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I didn't yeah. even do anything. I just failed 50 times, and it let me watch it. Yeah, usually, usually to me on the UFCs it was five to seven minutes. But I had one show where you know I missed like the whole first fight. It took me like thirty five minutes. But the point of all this is that there's no excuse in this day and age for something like this on a pay per view. There's just, I mean, especially for UFC because it's like it's one thing if you go, oh, it was a Conor McGregor pay per view and they're not used to it. I mean, this is every freaking UFC pay per view. I mean, it's 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 to the point where it's just like. It's like I'm almost, I'm almost like just whatever, you know. It's like I'm so tired of it. And, um, I mean, I didn't have that <laughs> problem here, but, I mean, people have that problem with, with Bleach Report. We've, we hear it all the time. And, um, you know, I mean, you can, you know, you can still get it on television. And I've certainly had no trouble ever with television on the pay per views. And I don't think I've had trouble with Ble- Bleach Report, but, um, you know, whatever. It's, uh, I'm sure, you know, plenty of people do. So, um, but that probably didn't help. But yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, um, I haven't really like monitored like the feedback. I mean, I got a lot of feedback, but I get a lot of feedback on every AEW pay per view. So I don't know if that really is, tells me anything about, you know, as far as how well it did. I mean, Tony Khan didn't give a number afterwards, but he did say it's going to be one of the biggest of all time. So, and I figured it, it would be among the bigger ones. So we'll see. All right, there really wasn't much of the collision show. The main event was really good. It was Christian Killswitch, Roderick Strong, and Brian Cage versus Hook, Daniel Garcia, Trent, and Orange Cassidy. And match itself, I mean, there was a lot of good wrestling, but at the end of the day, it's like, this is the go-home main event before the pay-per-view. And the finish was uh, Killswitch pin Trent. Yeah. Neither of them on the show. Well, Killswitch was sort of on the show, and Trent was backstage. Just a um, match to a match. Yeah, well, yeah. But they did suffer from uh, a lack of heat in a lot of the segments. There's good heat for the Buddy Matthews and Mark Briscoe brawl. Yeah, I saw that. that. Uh, ended with Buddy. They brawl over, and, and Mark Briscoe sets off the pyro. And for some reason, it's like 10 feet away from Buddy, but Buddy still sells it. And then he goes to try and put his head into the pyro again, and this time the referees stop him from blowing his face off. But uh, they'll be feuding. And then we had Penta, Brian Keith, and Dante Martin to uh, qualify for the scramble, which uh, Dante won. And, man, if you go on Twitter, all of Dante's botches are all over Twitter. He had a uh, rough time here. Mm. And uh, finally uh, hit the big splash on Keith and got the pin. And then we had... uh, Yeah, it's too bad because it's like the politics and everything. It's like, you know, Pinto was not allowed on this show. Because Magnus was on the show. This might not have been the Dante match, as I look at my notes. I could be wrong. But right. he, he had a he had a match. I just watched it, but maybe it was this match. But, like, he tried a bunch of stuff and just, like, slipped on one spot after another and almost killed himself. He was just going way too fast. And then once things started to go wrong, he started to go faster, and then it was even worse. But I uh, had a Hangman video after Dynamite where he vowed not to let Swerve win the title. We had... Uh, Mariah beating Angelica Risk, which is fine for what it was, nothing special. And then Tony and Deanna had a face-to-face and uh, absolutely no heat whatsoever for their face-to-face. They just talked about the pay-per-view match, and Tony said, Goodbye, old friend, and she kissed her, and Deanna attacked her. Mariah hit the ring to pull her off. Deanna grabbed her, hit the short pile driver, and laid her out. We had Dark Order versus the Acclaimed and Austin Gunn. So again, Max Caster comes out. He's going to do his rap. But this time, too. Jay it's White hugs him, and he loses a train of thought, and he doesn't do his rap. Yeah, yeah. He he just, tonight, he just stopped in mid-rap and pretended that he forgot what he was doing, and Billy Gunn was scolding him and all that. So the new gimmick is, is that he screws up the rap every time. I don't like this gimmick at all, by the way. <laughs> don't think it serves much of a purpose. So Max had the flying elbow for the pin on Reynolds. Work was good, but it was just kind of a match. We had uh, Wardlow promo, and the first promo he did was basically a recap of the last one, so it was just kind of there. And then Jericho comes out, 
And he's talking about the scramble. He's an eight-time world champion, first ever AW champion. He says, that's Jericho 8, Wardlow 0, because you ain't one shit. And so now Wardlow's mad. And so he actually <coughs> cut a great promo where he basically said, and it was kind of weird because he goes, I was this close to the top of the mountain. I could smell it. I could almost reach it. After double or nothing, I showed up for work only to take a step back and then down, down, down. It pissed me off. Let it eat away at me. Ruined my personal life. I lost my best friend because of it. And then he goes, three months, no communication, no phone call. I was like, what? Why is this part of the promo? Why did no one call you for three months? What the hell is going on? They, they, lost his, they lost his number. I don't know. He said, I'm done eating scraps. If you think I'm not good enough, come show me. And Jericho said, I'll shove that rocket right up your ass. So Hobbs shows up and jumps Jericho and lays him out. And he says, I'll beat your ass too, Wardlow. So that was the build for the match tonight. Matt Seidel, Chris Daniels versus Private Party. Crowd was pretty much dead. Private Party, uh, they got the win. Jarrett's crew came down and... Uh, they've now got a whoever Jared's crew, whatever their name is, their oddities. They're they they in private party are now a group. Mm-hmm. Thunder Rosa beat Cassandra Golden, and then uh, that was pretty much the show. So it's kind of a by the numbers episode of Collision. Nothing all that special on it. But then we got to talk about this SmackDown show. Mm. Forty minutes on the Rock. And Roman Reigns. So it was weird because it's like The Rock did this long promo. And, you know, he he basically set up the, the tag team match. But he didn't really say much. You know, it's like his promo, the... The 21-minute the, the tw- one? The 21-minute promo was awesome. Yes. That, that was freaking awesome. And he said a lot there. And this one, you know, it's like that should have been the promo on television, except he swore a lot and he couldn't put that one on television and probably said a bunch of inside stuff that they didn't want on television, which is probably why he did the promo the way he did. But it's so weird. So so he does this promo. Okay, so Is this the 21-minute one or the SmackDown one? The Well, the, 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 the Twitter promo. Okay. Here's the Twitter promo on Friday morning. So I woke up on Friday morning and I'd seen messages that like uh, – he did this promo because they weren't going to give him enough time on SmackDown. And I said, that's ridiculous. Rock can get as much time as he wants. I mean, who's going to say, hey, you know, we'd rather run a five-minute Austin Theory match or we can let The Rock be on for five more minutes, right, and and all that. So checked with somebody who I know with over there, pretty high up, and I said, there's a story going around. I know it's bullshit. And they go, in bullshit. <laughs> He goes, he can't get as much time as he wants. This isn't working this way. Well, I think so, I think the issue is not so much how much time he can get, because he was on the show for 40 minutes. No. I think the issue is an uninterrupted 21 minutes without a commercial in there. No, 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 no. The, the, issue, the issue was is that originally he wasn't going to get that much time, so he did this promo. But when he got there, he got all the time he wanted because he's The Rock. They said he's not going to get it, but he did. Because he's the Rock, he can get whatever he wants. Because well, they they clearly were doing something to uh, to make sure they could have some commercial time in there to make this work. Because well, they, they did they did a commercial break. Well, the yeah. first thing that happened is is first Roman comes down to the ring, and it takes about five minutes. And then when he nothing. gets to the ring, he goes, "If I don't get a better reaction, I'm leaving." And then he lets him try again. Then let's try again. And he goes, "All right, I'm out of here." And so then Paul goes, "No, no, no we got business to attend to." We'll do it after the break. So literally, like the first, I timed it actually. It, it was between that and the Rock's entrance. We had twenty minutes of absolutely nothing, and then a commercial break there, and then finally Rock did his his big promo. And yeah, they're doing it at WrestleMania. It's a tag team match. It is Rock and Roman Reigns versus Cody and Seth on night one, and the stipulation is that if you two jabronis win. On night one of WrestleMania, the night two, it'll be Cody Rhodes versus Roman and no bloodline. But if they win on night one, then it is a bloodlines rules match, which means anything goes. They can have Solo sing the anthem. They can have Jimmy be the ref. They can have anybody they want out there. And uh, he said, I am on the board. I own it all. I'm Cody's boss, which got a Triple H chant, by the way. And he says, how tough do you think you are, punks? And so he's about to leave, and then Roman says, I need a favor. And Roman tells him, 
you need to acknowledge me. And there's a long stare down. The crowd gasps. And then finally, Rock says, Roman Reigns, my family, I acknowledge you as my tribal chief. They shake hands. They hug. Everybody holds up the fingers, except Rock, who makes an L every time. And uh, They were definitely teasing. I mean, the whole time Rock's doing his promo, Reigns is looking at him all he's dirty. He's seething. Yeah, he's looking at him all dirty. I mean, they're definitely teasing something for down the of line. Of course. Yeah. The question is, I mean, do we do the turn on night one? Or is that uh, night two? A tease, or where are we going here? Maybe uh, they win on night one. They're all out there, and then uh, Roman causes uh, Cody to win. I mean, you, I mean, I'm, know, I'm, I'm, Dwayne causes Cody to win. There was an interesting thing that I noted, which was when Rock was doing his 21 minute uh, promo. He's recapping everything that happened. Yeah, and he mentions that Cody stepped aside. And mm-hmm. then he says, I whispered something in Cody's ear. And he claims in the promo that he said, you know. Do it for the soul man. Do it for the dream. Wh- whatever it was that he said. But I think it, I think there's a very good chance in the end they're going to try and make sense of all of this by having Rock tell him, let's get this guy. Mm-hmm. And it was a ruse from day one, I think will be the final story. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Yeah. We had uh, a Grayson Theory segment where Randy Orton walked in on him, talking about him, and he challenged Theory to a main event. Well, he, he challenged either of them, and then Waller basically... Waller threw Theory under the bus for the second time. Right, right, yeah. Tiffany Stratton beat Naomi with the PME. And then we had Kabuki Warriors versus Dakota Kai and Bailey. So Ole Anderson passed away. You knew we had to have a horseman beat down at some point. Dakota's yeah. on the uh, ring apron the whole time, and they make it very clear. You're supposed to be wondering, like, whose side is she on? And then, of course, Bailey goes for the tag. Dakota drops off the apron, and uh, they beat up Bailey. They triple-team her. They didn't beat her up that bad, though. Should have done worse. There's still plenty of time. And they didn't ring the bell or anything, so I think it's still going on. Yeah, it was no contest. But, yeah, the bell never rang. We had damage control running in a Jade backstage, and then Nick walked up and said, I need to talk to you, Jade. Braun Breaker squashed a dude, speared him, killed him instantly. It was uh, Zion Quinn, the, the boyfriend of Harley Cameron. Oh, was it? How about Zion that? Quinn, yeah. He used Zion to be in, Quinn. He used I to remember be in, Zion Quinn, yeah. He used to be in NXT, and then they called him up to the main roster, and then he disappeared for like months and, for months. Yeah, I totally forgot he got called up. Yeah, yeah. We had a legato video package which led to Santos versus Carlito in a street fight and as a match it was like okay because like Carlito is so slow he sure is and he's like he honky tonk sure man is. now where he doesn't even take bumps anymore like he's supposed to put Santos to a table with like a spine buster but he didn't even go to his knees he just like went like this and just stood there and so uh, anyway Ray's music hits. He hobbles down to the ring on crutches. Angel and Berto go after him, but it's a trap, and he destroys both guys with the crutches. And then Carlito spits the apple into Santos' face. Cruz and Wild hit dives. Ray hits a 619. Carlito puts Santos through a table, gets the pin. It was a feel good moment style match. Fans went nuts for Ray Mysterio. They were so happy to see him back. He's got a white goatee now. He's kind of like a. He was dressed, to be, he was dressed up to be Great Muda. He was yeah. Great Muda. He looked just like him. Yeah, yeah, with the, with the Great Muda white coatee and the Great Muda mask, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, that was that. It was good stuff. We had Pete and Tyler Bate asking Nick if they could get a rematch against Judgment Day, and he said, well, you know, I got a lot to think about. And it sounds to me like they're going to do some sort of tag team sort of thing at WrestleMania, multi-person match or something like that. Or maybe a tournament. Yeah. Yeah, but they're going to make an announcement pretty soon about what they're going to do with the tag team titles, yeah. So L.A. flew in, said he was looking for A.J., because A.J. flew all the way to Australia to beat him up, and uh, he says, I'm going to find him, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. So then we had Randy Orton, Austin Theory, Kevin Owens on commentary, and uh, this was a really fun match. I enjoyed this immensely. And uh, they had a spot where... I watched this like three dozen times. I couldn't believe oh, my the, eyes. Oh, the, the, the superplex that turned into a blockbuster, except Randy Orton didn't sell the blockbuster? That's not what happened. Oh. So Randy goes up top, and he's going to do a superplex, okay? Except he, except he falls off the ropes. Well, he's got 
Theory's head hooked. So Theory's like got his chin tucked. He's looking away. He doesn't know what's going on because he's getting ready for a superplex. He's got his head down and tucked to take a move. So Randy's going to go, but his foot slips. Yeah. So Theory, I guess, thought he's going. And so Theory jumps for the superplex. And so, you know, Randy, you know, if you ever walked and just slipped, it's like he's just going to climb up again. But literally, as he's landing on the ground, he realizes this dude went for it. And so in mid-move, he takes the bump and does the superplex. I was like, wow. Like, it's one thing to watch it, and then, you know, in hindsight, you think about this or that. But in the split second, he had to make that decision to finish the superplex. And it was like, I was blown away. And then the finish was so awesome. Uh, Theory goes for his diving forward roll. He does like a diving forward roll into a blockbuster. So he does a diving forward roll into the ring. He jumps for the blockbuster, and Randy Orton hits the RKO out of midair. Kevin Owens on commentary, like Kevin Owens marking out on commentary is the best gimmick of 2024. He just flipped out at this move. Randy Orton gets the pin. And then, of course, Grayson goes after Randy afterwards. And so Waller hits the ring to beat him up, and Kevin goes, that ain't going to happen. So he hits the ring, and he gives uh, Austin Theory a stunner. Austin Theory took the best bump for this stunner. And then uh, Randy and Kevin Owens shook hands afterwards. It looks like they're going to be a tag team. Yeah, it looks like we're going to have a tag team thing here. Randy Orton and Kevin Owens versus Waller and Theory. Yeah. And uh, Theory, I mean, he was great in this match. Yeah. Not going to be for t- tag team for WrestleMania, though, because uh, it's very clear they're doing uh, Randy Orton and Logan Paul. Randy Orton and Logan Paul. Yeah. What a match. Yeah. No, I mean, they're going to have a great match. It will be. It'll be the best match. I shouldn't say it's the best match that uh, he's ever had, but that's the right kind of guy, Randy Orton, to work with you. We've got, um, what do we got? Raw tomorrow, March 4th. Becky Lynch, Nia Jax. Drew McIntyre, Jay Uso. And Drew McIntyre and Jay Uso. So that is the lineup for the show. And as we noted, we don't have any idea what's going on on Dynamite this week. They've got the one match announced, and uh, other than that, who knows. And then for uh, NXT, which did not do good numbers, by the way, last week, we've got the Roadblock Show, which is a... Uh, so they'll probably do well, because yep. they usually do well on themed shows. we got Carmelo Hayes and Tony D, with the winner getting a championship match over Mania Weekend. Kabuki Warriors versus Lyra and Tatum for the tag team titles. Baron Corbin, Braun Breaker against Chase U for the tag titles. Dijak versus Joe Gacy in an asylum match. And Sean Spears will appear. So that's the lineup for the next couple of days. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's it from here. But I want to advise everybody, check out the uh, Garrett Show on Friday. Because uh, rave reviews. Lance was on there talking about Vince McMahon. And uh, he had a lot to say. About mm-hmm. old Vince. So check that one out. It wasn't and, just about Vince. It was about the, the whole culture and how much it changed. Sure, yeah. How much wrestling has changed. I mean, it just reminded me, remember when we were at, um, I think it was All In. Um, the first All In, not the one this year. Um, and there was like the group of all of the modern wrestlers, you know, that were hanging out in one room. or well, They were all in the same room. But then on the other side of the room, there was all of the guys from the WCW, WWF days that were all, you know what I mean? They were all there, and they were all drinking. And the other guys, nobody's drinking. And it was just like, what a complete, it's like, it's like the one group, you have all these, you know, guys that are smaller and in shape, and they're not drinking. And the other one is these big alkies. You know what I mean? That's what it was. And it's like, that's the difference in wrestling right there. Like, right before your eyes. Two completely different generations. Different worlds, different generations. And Lance w- was interesting because Lance kind of bridges it because Lance started during that generation. And he, you know, I mean, he's not a wrestler now, but he's still an agent. He's still around. And he's completely around during this generation where he would have fit in so much better. Because he told a story, you know, um, about when... Um, he had just gotten there from from WCW, so they had wrestlers court, and Howard Finkel was, 
I think one of the women was slap, was going to slap Howard Finkel, and he flinched, and he wasn't supposed to flinch. So he had to go to wrestler's court, and they just harassed poor Howard and made him cry, like literally made him cry. And Lance thought it was horrible, and then he felt bad because he didn't speak out. And I didn't say this because I didn't, I mean, but here's the reality. It's like he had just come from WCW, so he already has half a mark on his back, okay? And even bigger than coming from WCW, he doesn't drink. And I know what happened to guys who don't drink in that period. It was like, that was not a, a good thing. I mean, like, some of the stuff you hear about certain people getting, like, major harassed, and you don't know why. You know, I mean, you've probably seen it in books and stuff. It's because the there's, there was a, a group of people in WWE that if you didn't drink, they made your, you know, like, now you can, if, if you're in WWE and you don't drink, it's this whole group of you know what I mean? It's not a big deal. But back then, there were some, but they were harassed pretty bad if they didn't drink. You know, I mean, because that's just how it was. So here's Lance who doesn't drink, and he comes from WCW. If he would have spoke up about Howard Finkel, it would have been curtains for poor Lance, which he didn't do. But it's just a measure of that, uh, you know, certain aspects of that locker room back then. You know, and, and one person, I don't want to say who it was, but you can probably figure it out, who was with the company right now, who was a big, big star during that period, huge star during that period, who's still there and still involved. And someone who I know, just we had a conversation about this just a couple of days ago, and it's just telling me about how, yeah, I talked to this person. And, you know, you we say how, like, it's so much better now. And we were, that was actually the conversation. It's so much better now. You know, it's not like it was 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 2005, I think was the time frame we were talking about, where, you know, we had all the, you know, the, the early deaths, among other things, among many other things. And he goes, like, it's funny because the person says, like, it's so sad about wrestling now because when we were on top, it was a bunch of men. You know what I mean? We were a bunch of men, not like these guys now. Mm. You know, and it's just like, ah, oh, God, you know, you come from that, that thing. And it's like, that's the, that's the theory. So it's a bunch of men go out there and get drunk, be bullies to everybody, you know? Well, you know, some things never change. Yeah. At least with certain people. But hopefully everything does change for uh, the better. That's all we can hope for. But uh, that show is up. It's uh, from Friday. And we'll be back tomorrow talking uh, Monday Night Raw and all of the other news and the back issue, new issue of The Observer, lots of stuff on the front page. So check it out, everybody. And that's it. We'll talk to you again after a while.